morning, friends. My name is Bud Reedy. I'm the lead pastor of the Charlottesville First Church of Nazareth. And I want to welcome you to the Keswick Chapel, which is a ministry that begins at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning here at CSDN. There we go. We have some sound is by. That's awesome. <laughs> but this morning is a special edition of the Keswick Chapel. We have with us uh, some special guests. They've been with us all weekend. Uh, this is Pastor Frank Short, and we are so glad to have him with us. He's the lead pastor of the Real Life Chapel in Easton, Maryland, and he is with us this weekend, um, sharing with us about how to become a disciple-making church. How to become a disciple-making church. Um, I believe that um, it's only a very small percentage of churches that have an intentional, strategic plan for making disciples. And it's the one thing Jesus asked us to do. So Frank has been with us, sharing with us from his heart and from his experience about how to become a disciple-making church. Actually, he shared with us for three hours yesterday in a seminar-type seminar. And we thought that we would ask him uh, just to share a shortened version of that, 45 minutes in length, maybe 50. But this morning he's going to be sharing a bridge version of what he presented to us yesterday. I am so excited that you have an opportunity to hear this. And it's my hope that hundreds of people will have an opportunity to hear this. Pastors, uh, lay people hear um, these steps for becoming a disciple-making church. And so I want to give a warm welcome to my friend and disciple-maker, uh, Pastor Frank Short. Thank you very much, Bud. I appreciate that. I'm going to take care of one technical thing right while we're uh, getting started, and that is getting the television turned on in the back because I'm going to need that. Anyway, good morning. Uh, someone's going to help me out with that. So just uh, glad to be here this morning, glad to have the opportunity uh, to walk through this information with you. I, I think it's critical, uh, as Pastor Bud alluded to. I, I think that is absolutely true that most churches do not have an intentional strategic plan uh, in making disciples or becoming a disciple-making church. And so again, as like he said, uh, this is an abridged version. I'm going to try to get through this information it may uh, uh, seem rapid fire, uh, but I'm going to try to cover the important pieces, the important elements that I think that we addressed yesterday. And so I want to start off this morning uh, just with a, a simple statement. Uh, this was a stat that was uh, presented in uh, George Barna's uh, book, Revolution. And, and this, is, this is the phrase, because this should uh, catch us. Uh, maybe take our breath away if we're really concerned. It says this, statistics tell us that a typical believer will die without leading a single person to a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm going to repeat that one more time. We, we need to really hear that, let that sink in. Statistics tell us that a typical believer will die without leading a single person into a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We know that that ought not be so. That's not what things are supposed to be. We have a mission. And so maybe we just need a, a little remedial. We need to review and be reminded of that. So let's go there real quick. I'm going to get my uh, uh, little tool here so I can advance things. And we're going to look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Uh, this is up on the screen. I don't know if you can see it by Facebook Live, but I'm going to read this to you. Uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So look, here's the, here's the neat thing. Church leaders, pastors around the country, 
uh, we, we spend all kinds of energy and all kinds of time trying to craft these clever, uh, acute mission statements. Well, the mission statement is right there. It's very clear. It's very plain. In Matthew 28, the mission is simply to go and make disciples. He tells us what it is. Jesus says, I've been given all authority. So guess what? We don't have to get a second opinion. We don't have to check with anyone else. He has the authority. He is the final word. And in his final words, he said, go and make disciples. Now, there's the mission. And then later it says, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded them. Well, what was the first command he just gave a, a sentence ago? Go and make disciples. It's real simple. We complicate things. We get lost in the sauce looking at all kinds of stuff. Go and make disciples. But here's the beautiful thing. He says, and you'll never, ever have to do it alone. I will be with you in this process of going and making disciples. So when we hear this, here, here's the fact. Every single believer, every single believer is commanded to go and make disciples. It's not just for the paid professionals. It's not for somebody that has a pastoral or some kind of vocational calling on their life. Every single one of us is commanded to go and make disciples. So with that, if we know that that's the mission, go and make disciples, every one of us are supposed to be actively participating in that process, then we need to know what a disciple is. And, and we can get great definitions from folks, and, and they'll be accurate, but yet it can be all over the place, and it be, can be difficult sometimes to wrap our head around it to really get focused. So I, I want to give you what I believe is a real simple, straightforward definition. Uh, and this definition, I say that the definition can be found in the invitation. When Jesus began recruiting his disciples... Matthew 4, 19, this is what it says. And he said to them, he's speaking of Jesus, said to them, James and John, right? He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And that statement, so simple, and yet there are three key elements to a, a, a definition of what a disciple is. And that is following me, right? So following Jesus right, is one part of it, and I will make you, he will make us, or, or he will change us, and then fishers of men, that's what we're to be doing, that's that discipleship process, fishers of men, so we have this breakdown, just right here in this invitation is the definition, disciples are those who are following Jesus, right, that requires a decision right here, it's a head change, then I will make you, a disciple is someone who's being changed by Jesus, being changed from the inside out, that's a heart change that's going on. Our motives begin to change. That happens through relationship over time. And then the final element, fishers of men. That's what he's calling us, fishers of men. We're to go and make disciples. So a disciple is someone who's on mission with Jesus, with him, because he said we'll never have to do it alone, right? And that's a heart, that's a hands and foot change, right? That's where we get involved actively. So real quickly, a disciple is someone who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and on mission with Jesus. Okay, so we're going to keep moving along, and I want to talk to you about how we grow. Now, whether this is speaking to you directly, or this is referring to those who you are going to disciple, or you, maybe you're currently discipling, here's the fact of the matter. Just like we all grow biologically we grow through different stages we do the same thing spiritually right we, we go through different stages in our spiritual development we don't get to bypass any of the stages any more than you and i get to bypass biological stages right we don't get to go from being two years old to 20 years old it just doesn't happen we have to get there and the same thing spiritually we grow through stages so i want to show you i have an illustration this wheel that you'll see on the screen, it's, uh, it's giving you the stages of development. And if we look at the very top, at, looking at 12 o'clock, the very first stage is dead. It says dead, spiritually dead. Scripture tells us in multiple places that if we are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, 
we have not accepted him as our Lord and Savior, that we are spiritually dead. John 5, 24, talking about those who make, that bridge that, and it says they pass from death to life. Or we can look into Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, where it begins to talk about where we were dead in our sins or dead in our trespasses. It, it, the fact of the matter, prior to relationship with Jesus Christ, we are spiritually dead, separated from God. And then you'll see I have like a little, there's like this little wedge in the diagram, and that wedge is born again, right? And so somehow, and hopefully somebody has taken the initiative, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but they've been presented with the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is, and they've been receptive to that, and now they've entered into this relationship with Jesus Christ. We call that being born again. And when you hear the word born, that's a clue to the next stage. When a baby is born, they're just that, a baby, or we call them an infant. So the first stage, when we enter into relationship with Jesus Christ, nobody gets to bypass it. We all become spiritual infants. And that's whether you're 15 or you're 55 or you're 75. doesn't matter if you've got a Ph.D. or you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You begin as a spiritual infant because it's day one walking in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we talk about the characterizations. In dead, we talk about being characterized by either unbelief or rebellion. But when we're talking about spiritual infants, we say that spiritual infants are characterized by ignorance. And sometimes when we, I say that to folks, you know, immediately, uh, what? You know, it, it's not that somebody's uneducated. It's not that somebody is stupid or, you know, unintelligent. That's not what is meant by that at all. It just means they simply don't know what they don't know. It's all brand new. Walking in a relationship with Jesus Christ is a new experience. And, you know, you can read about something, but it's different when you're actually experiencing that. And so it's all brand new. Now, depending on the maturity of somebody or the uh, background experience or understanding they may have, that, that stage may be shortened, right? Because they may know more about things. Maybe they, they have a better grasp on things and they learn quickly. Some people are in that stage a little longer. But just like you and I biologically, biologically we kind of say zero to two is what we call an infant. Similarly, in a spiritual sense, we're in that stage for a brief time in comparison to other stages. Just like we grow out of our infancy, biologically we grow into childhood. And so the next stage is a spiritual child. Now, again, just like the biological comparison, you and I are children much longer than we are infants. And, and you know, different people have differing, uh, you know, definitions of what that is, whether it's two to 12 or, or 2 to 18 or 2 to 16. Maybe it depends on who they're living with and dealing with. But here's the reality. We're in that stage a longer time. Okay? And I think, unfortunately, some people can become stalled in their maturing and, and development. Some people can spend decades in this stage. But it doesn't mean you have to. I know of young folks that are, that are in their late 20s that have moved through these stages quickly. Right, because of a determination and a focus and a willingness and a sacrifice. But I've also seen people who are in their 50s, 60s that are still in this stage. Anyway, spiritual children are characterized by this. Selfishness and self-centeredness. They are the center of their own universe. Right? It is all about them. You know, and it's just like children. You and I, all we got to do is take two children with one toy, put them in a room and watch what happens. Right? If you don't think it's there, it will show itself. Selfishness is going to rise. And we demonstrate that. When somebody is, is in the spiritual stage of, of spiritual child, everything is about them. Right? A lot of I statements, a lot of me statements. You know, I didn't like that. I was hurt by that. You know, I didn't get what I prefer. You know, we just, everything, our complaints, you know, our struggles, even our victories are all about us. You know? And, and a lot of people, unfortunately, get stuck there. Now, spiritual children can serve in the church. I'm not saying that they won't serve somehow in a ministry. But typically, their service uh, is based on either being seen, receiving that, you know, all the time. Um, you'll see that the service of spiritual children uh, will continue, provided that the reward always outweighs the sacrifice 
So that's spiritual children. And then uh, the next spiritual stage, we move from spiritual child to spiritual young adult. I kind of say this is where spiritual puberty happens. There's a sudden change in the voice, right? It begins to sound different. They begin to speak different because there is a serious mental and spiritual shift that takes place. And you see that what characterizes a spiritual young adult is all of a sudden, instead of this self-centered, this selfishness, now it is others-centered. It is God-centered. It becomes a complete shift in their motivation of why they're doing things and, and what the goal is. The goal is to expand the kingdom of God, to bring glory to God, and for the benefit of others. That's a major shift for people. And so spiritual young adult... Again, folks will stay and linger there a little longer, just like we spend a little longer in our teen years than we do in infancy. Usually the child is the longest duration of those three stages, right? But they're characterized by service, and their service is for the benefit of others. Um, I can give you a couple different scriptures just to, to, for reference points if you want to look at these later. Uh, I mentioned John 5, 24, and Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 with the spiritual dead. Spiritual infancy, you could look at 1 Peter 2, 2 through 3. I'm just mentioning these. You could look at them later. Uh, the child, you can look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. But I also really think a great characterization of these stages is found in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, where it mentions children and fathers and those who are young in, in the spiritual faith. So this is something that's not just made up by me or by real life discipleship ministries. This was something that is biblical. This is found in the scriptures. And then the final stage on the wheel, as we go around this wheel, it, we see that it's spiritual parent, right? And spiritual parent is something that's there, um, very intentional, which is characterized by that, but also the fact of the matter, we don't say, spiritual adult because we can have a tendency to think that there is an arrival point or a, a completion point you know and, and and that it stops and that is not the case but the other important piece is that what parents do and what parents are about the fact that somebody is a parent means there's a child in other words reproduction because that is what you and i are called to do to go and make disciples we are called to reproduce Right? This is not to stop with us. We're called to pour into others to reproduce. Right? And again, what are we making? We're not making disciples of ourselves. We're making disciples of Jesus. And that's why it's important as we're growing in this relationship. You know, a friend of mine, 90-year-old navigator, Skip Gray, he says, you teach what you know, you reproduce who you are, you know, and who we are in Christ. Big, big important thing. And so parents are characterized by being intentional, being strategic. They're really starting to think about the relationships and the time and effort they're putting in, right? They're, they're, they're being strategic with their time and energy, but they're being intentional with relationships and being involved because they're looking at how can I pour into the life of another person and help them grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that's kind of how we grow uh, through the stages but I want to cover this next piece I want to kind of cover the how um, because I think in a, in, a, in a limited sense um, we're kind of aware that that was the mission we were given was to go and make disciples we may need to be reminded but we're kind of aware of that and whether we have that specific definition that that we use you know as a disciple someone following Jesus being changed by Jesus and on mission with Jesus we may have some varying definitions. I think probably one of the greatest areas that we were unsure of is the how, right? Okay, if that's what a disciple is, and I understand people grow, I can kind of look around me and see differences of where people are at. Um, but how do I go about doing that? And so we've got a tool for that, and I want to share that in a moment um, because it is a process. It is an important process, and it's not a program, it's not a curriculum, it is a process. We don't want to say program because when people think of that, whether you have a six-week program or a 12-week program, they think it ends. And that's not what we're trying to make happen. What we want is discipleship to become a lifestyle. And so um, let's take a look in the scripture too in Acts 2.42. 
It says this, that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Apostles, I'm going to point that out. Teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Now, just in this scripture alone, there are some different components that we think are vital for having or experiencing a successful journey of discipleship, right? We all know that life is a journey, right? It's a journey that we all go on. Well, discipleship is exactly the same. It is a journey, right? It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It is a journey that happens over time. So like any journey or say a trip that you and I go on, uh, there's some key elements that make that journey successful. We think the same way with the discipleship journey. So this, I didn't use this yesterday, but I've had this slide up here. Here are the three components to a successful journey, right? If we're going to go on a trip, we need a driver, we need a vehicle, and we need a map. Now, we may use a GPS today, but you understand, we, we need a map. We need directions on how to get where it is we're intending to go. Okay, and that makes a successful journey. Well, in discipleship terms, we look at the driver as an intentional leader. It's someone who is driving the process of discipleship. Now, that might be in a relationship on a one-on-one -on -one basis, or it could be in a group setting, right? And it could be the person who's kind of driving or facilitating that group experience. But somebody has to be taking the initiative, and that is the driver. Now, the vehicle, the vehicle um, we like to think of when it comes to discipleship as a relational environment. Discipleship happens best in relationship. It's a relational environment, right? Relationship is key to true discipleship occurring. Deep relationships are necessary in discipleship, and they don't happen accidentally. Right? It requires intentionality. It requires investment into other people. Now, relational environment, I want to talk about it as the vehicle. Just remember this, though. Relational environments are the vehicle. They're not the destination. Right? The destination is spiritual maturity. Right? Becoming disciple, uh, disciple makers, spiritual parents, so we're reproducing. That's the goal. The relational environment is simply the vehicle to get there. But the most difficult thing, as we alluded to at the very beginning of this, um, is the, the map, the reproducible process. And that's, again, where I'll say a lot of ministries, a lot of churches kind of understand intentional leader. There's a lot of leadership development that goes on. Leaving the idea of relational environments, there's a lot of uh, ministries that understand pushing people towards small groups, cell groups, life groups, whatever you want to uh, call them. I think we're all aware of that. I think the missing ingredient for most is this reproducible process, the how. So how do I engage people uh, that are going through these different stages? And, you know, what is their greatest need? How can I fulfill that need? You know, because here's what we're doing. We're cooperating, right? Make no mistake, you and I don't, on our own, make disciples, Right? That's why Jesus said, I'll be with you, because if he ain't with us, it ain't happening, right? So just think of it this way, where the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the people of God come together, that's when discipleship happens, right? And so that's what this map is about. It, it lets you and I know how we can cooperate in the process of the development of folks, and so I uh, want to take a look at this, this map. Uh, and this is a wheel. And at first you might go, oh, no, there's a whole lot on there, right? But just for this morning, just for our purposes and in our time together right now, I just want to really kind of look at the outer rim uh, of this wheel. The, the inner rim, we kind of looked at earlier, and that's with the different stages. Spiritually dead, spiritual infant, spiritual child, spiritual young adult, spiritual parent. Now as we're looking at the how part, this, this reproducible process, we're looking at the outer rim. And, and that can be represented by these four things. Share, connect, minister, and disciple. Okay? Because here's the thing. Again, at different points in our development, we have different primary needs. 
And if we can engage folks, if we can kind of assess and identify where they're at, then we can engage them at the point of their greatest need, right? Because sometimes, we, you know, you could throw a whole bunch of stuff at somebody and it's like, it can be overwhelming, right? And things possibly they don't even need to understand or deal with or, or wrestle with right now. But there's a greatest need and we need to be able to identify that. So when we're looking at uh, spiritual dead and spiritual infancy, and you'll see that on the outer part of the wheel, it's share. That's how you and I can be engaging. We need to be sharing. Well, sharing what? Right? And that's listed in there. So what we need to do when we're talking about people who are spiritually dead, people who are in, um, they live in our neighborhood. They, they work around us. You know, they, they're at the ball field, you know, because their kids are on the same team our kids are on. There's all kinds of settings where we come into contact or we interact with people who are not in relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to share our lives with them. Right? Just genuinely share your life with them. Interact with people. Get to know them. Right? As you and I share our lives with them, then we earn the right to speak into their lives. And we can gain a hearing. Right? And, and at the right moment and the right opportunity, we can share the gospel, which is their greatest need. They may think they need a hundred other things. But I'm telling you, someone who is not in relationship with Jesus Christ, their greatest need is to hear the gospel. And this may be shocking to you, but there are folks who have sat in churches for years and have never heard the gospel. I wish I, I, wish I couldn't say that and know that it's an accurate statement. But it is. As a pastor, I've had people that have that have come to our ministry and have sat and told me, I, I've been in church for 20 years. That was the first time I ever heard somebody share the gospel. And, and I remember the first time that happened. I was just like mind blown. But then it happened again, and it's happened again. So think about that. If we have people who can be inside churches have not heard, truly heard the gospel, people who have never set a foot a door anywhere, how many times have they had somebody intentionally take the time and wait for that right opportunity to share the gospel, right? The truth of who Jesus is. When they're receptive to that, they may not always be receptive to that. Sometimes you might have the opportunity to say it a few times, right? But if they're receptive to that and they accept him and they enter into a relationship with him, now they're that spiritual infant. We still need to share with them, right? We, we, don't, we still need to continue in relationship with them. But now... Our sharing kind of broadens because as they're walking in this newness of life, this new experience, they need someone to share new truths with them, right? Because it's all brand new. This is all brand new, right? And so the truth we're sharing with them is not, oh, Frank's great hundred ideas. No, we're talking about the truths that are in the Bible, right? The truth of Scripture. That's what we need to be sharing with them. And then we need to share new habits with them. One of those is going to be as simply as saying, hey, you ought to start reading the Bible, right? It, it, there's a lot of things we, we talk about in church as spiritual disciplines. Those are the new habits I'm talking about. Helping somebody establish those and begin those in their life. Those are the new habits we need to be sharing with them. And then as somebody grows out of infancy and they're now entering into that spiritual child stage, th there's, a, there's a different need that kind of rises to the surface being primary. And it's not so much that initial sharing, but now it's connecting. They need to connect in relationship. It's going to be critically important that they, they see and understand what a spiritual family is, right? And so we help them connect. And so that's where we can meet them at their greatest point in need. And so that can be a continuation of these new truths. And we say, hey, let's help them connect deeper to God. How can I share that with them? Right? One of the resources I love to share with people, um, I've got a little booklet. I brought a few of them in my bag. It's called How to Spend a Day in Prayer. Phenomenal experience, right? Now, most people are like, oh, 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 whole day in prayer. I'm not sure I can pray for five minutes, right? But, but it helps somebody walk through. That's all I'm talking about is we need to help them in developing a, a quiet time, a, a devotional time. Can you share devotion with them? Would you be willing to meet with somebody over coffee and say, hey, how about if we read a scripture together and talk about it? There are different ways we can help someone connect deeper to God. 
But then we need to also, again, help them connect to a spiritual family. And that can be best served. There's a lot of different ways, but best served getting them into that relational environment we're talked about, right? So, so if you do have uh, cell groups, light groups, small groups, whatever you happen to be calling them, that is a great time to connect a spiritual child into a group. It, you know what? Just being in the presence and in developing community with other believers helps them to have sounding boards, right? They, they, can, they can speak out loud some of the things they're thinking or talking about or wrestling with, and they can have someone else lovingly go, what? You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's talk about that, right? Let's talk about that. Because we need to know. You know what? If, if we're in isolation, which is never God's plan, right? This whole thing was never meant to be done in isolation, Right? Lone Ranger Christians don't survive. I can tell you that. Right? It's meant to be done in relationship. And in those relationships, we can have people that can, can be sounding boards for us. You know, and they can speak truth into our lives. It, it's a critical piece of understanding. Because then they'll help as they also hear other followers of Christ sharing their struggles, sharing their victories. They can kind of go, wow. I'm not the only one. I thought I was the only one. You know? And just knowing that there are others that kind of wrestle with some of the same things you do can be so encouraging. So encouraging. And then we need to connect them to their purpose. Right? And that's where uh, spiritual gifts come in. Understanding spiritual gifts and, and how God has gifted them and how they can tap or connect in those gifts to the body of Christ? Or what skills or abilities did God give them at their biological birth that now can be utilized in a way that can bring glory to God, expansion to the kingdom, and I mean fulfillment to them? When you're using your skills, your gifts, your talents for God's kingdom, you talk about fulfillment. More fulfillment in that than anything else. And then when somebody moves into the, I, I say going through spiritual puberty into the young adult stage, it changes. We, meeting them at that need, their need then isn't so much just the sharing or, or the connecting, but they're folks that have grown to a point, man, they need to be in the game. They need to be actively involved, right? They don't want to just sit in the circle. They, they want to, man, how can I, you know, put me in coach, right? Like the song, put me in coach. That's what they want to do. And so what we need to do, uh, if we're going to be a leader or we're helping people engage, we need to equip them, right? Well, that needed to start kind of through the child thing. As during that stage, we're beginning to equip them. We're teaching, we taught them new truths, right, new habits. We've connected them in relationship. And as they're doing this, all of this is developmental stuff. But we need to equip them now to, to serve in ministry, right? And so that now, that means preparing these spiritual young adults, it means preparing them for both success and failure, right? And, and, and we do them a disservice when we, when we don't prepare them for both, right? We need to prepare them because we want to help these spiritual young adults. We, we don't want to see them go through spiritual highs and spiritual lows. We want to prepare them so that they can make it through ministry. And then we want to give them opportunity. We've got to find a place to put them in so that they can serve. Right? I mean, that's what they want. They want so bad to have an opportunity. We need to make opportunity for them. And then we've got to release them. And so sometimes as leaders or pastors like myself, that can be the scariest point. That can be the risky point, right? Because we're going to give somebody an opportunity. We're going to release them. But we have to do that. We have to give people a chance to fail. Right? That's not what we're wanting to happen, but I'm saying you kind of have to sometimes give a person a chance to fail. And guess what? They may shock you and there may not be any failure. But if they do, guess what? I don't know about you. I've learned the greatest lessons in my life by the failures in my life. Now, I didn't say the fun lessons. I just said the greatest lessons, right? And they will do the same. But that's part of the maturing process. That's part of the developmental process. And then when we get around to spiritual parenthood, Spiritual parenthood, uh, we talk about being able to explain the process. A, a spiritual parent, really, it, it behooves them, again, to know the mission, right? To understand the definition. They need to really have a, a good sense of the spiritual stages of the development and how people develop and what their greatest need is 
at each point of development and also knowing the process. How do I engage that person at that particular stage? Right, so, so them understanding and being able to explain the discipleship process is, is critical. And then we release them to disciple with our help. You know that you and I, we can have someone walk, we can walk alongside of them and they, God may present an opportunity for them to disciple someone and they just need you to be that lifeline, right? You know what I mean? They're in a conversation, they're trying to help somebody and somebody asks them a question and they go, oh, I don't know the answer to that. Oh, by the way, that is like the best answer is the truth. If you don't know, just say you don't know, right? I do that. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 20 years. I do that all the time. I'll be like, hmm, that's a good one. I'll have to get back to you with you on that one, right? Because sometimes we just don't know. That's okay. I will tell you that will carry more weight with someone if you're willing to admit you don't know than if you sit there and babble on trying to act like you do and they're going, what? He don't know what he's talking about, right? So... But you, need, you can be the lifeline for somebody. Somebody might be walking alongside and discipling someone, and you're that phone call where they say, hey, man, um, you know, I was just wondering, this is crazy, but, you know, do you know who the Nephilim are or who, you know, it'd be any kind of crazy stuff. And you can go, oh, yeah, that's found in Genesis 6. You, know, you can go into different stories, or you can talk about where it is, and you may be able to offer, or you might go, oh, I don't know, you know, and so you got two I don't knows, and so now we both got a, a reason to dig in and start studying the word over something. Right? Or now an opportunity presents itself for you to study the Word with them. But look, as we're walking along, we need assistance. And we need, can offer assistance to other people. That's that releasing while we disciple with another person. It's not you standing there going, oh, no, you said that wrong. Right? No, no, it's, it's being there for another person. And then ultimately release them and say, oh, man, you don't need my help. You've got this. And you've got this not because of who you are. You've got this because God's got you. Right? And that's the important piece. And so we release them to disciple. But I will tell you, spiritual parents, spiritual parents need their peers. Right? Because there is no arrival. Right? We're still in this process. We're still doing this, this, this thing called life and life in Christ and discipleship. And sometimes we need those peers to encourage us. Because we may, you know what, you may not be discipling somebody every single day of your life. Right, man, I wish that was, yeah, I wish that was the case. But that's not the case. We'll have periods of time in our life where we'll be actively discipling somebody. And then there may be a period of time in between. As you and I are assessing and looking for the next person that God is placing in our life for us to disciple. Right? And we, we use that, that acronym, and it's been stated here so well, which I appreciate. Uh, you know, when you're looking and, and trying to, to find out, you know, God, who is it that you want me to look? Who do you want me to pour into? You know, we look for fat people, right? Don't get offended, right? I is one too. So, you know, fat people, people who are faithful, available, and teachable. And I try to take it a step further when we're talking about leadership, uh, Skip Gray always says that, you know, faith is the acronym for that. It's built off of the fat, uh, faithful, available, interdependent. We're looking for team players, uh, teachable, and then holy. You know, those that are walking in a holy life for the leaders. Those are the leaders that we need to be giving influence to those that are in this discipleship process. So, here's the how. You know, so if we're standing here and we go, wow, okay, I get it. The mission is for us to go and make disciples, no question, right? And everybody's commanded to be participating in that. What is a disciple? Well, I know a disciple is someone who's following Jesus, they're being changed by Jesus, and they're on mission with Jesus, right? And I understand that people, are, you know, grow through stages from spiritual infancy to spiritual childhood, spiritual young adulthood, and spiritual parenting. And, and I've, I've got a little bit of a sense now of how I can engage them in that process, you know, sharing with them, connecting with them, ministering disciple, right? And I know I need to be looking out for the fat folks, you know, uh, to, to recruit and pour into, or if I'm looking for leaders of those faith-filled folks, right? But maybe you're just standing here and you still go, man, I'm just not sure who. Well, if all of these things haven't helped you, I'll leave you with this statement from my friend Skip Gray. And he says this. He said, listen, surely 
There is someone out there that knows less about God than you do. Go find them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you for the opportunity, just in this brief moment, uh, to share some things that I think are just critically important for us to, to understand and to grasp. Lord, you've called us, you've commanded us to go and make disciples. Lord, I pray that something that was said uh, just in these past few moments uh, would be uh, inspiring, uh, encouraging, and even potentially challenging uh, to someone, but would be a spark to get them moving on the mission. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We want to thank uh, Pastor Frank Short for being with us here today at CFCN. He's going to be preaching in our 1030 service. Uh, we've just worked him like a rented mule <laughs> while he's been here. And what a joy it's been. Uh, well over a year ago, our pastoral staff here at CFCN and our church board met together. We met together and we just simply asked this question. What are the big eight or ten big hairy ideas that we need to be pursuing in the year 2021? We're going to pray about this for an entire year. And we did that. And it became clear that one of the things that kept coming up in that conversation was we need to be doing a better job at discipling people. That, that, that didn't mean that we weren't discipling people because we were and we are. But we felt like we needed to be doing a better job. And it was really as a result of that conversation that the way was born. The way is simply a congregational, strategic, intentional discipleship plan. Now, it's still very much under development, but the elements of that are very, very simple. It begins with the sermon on Sunday morning. There are a lot of people that believe that the primary focus of preaching in our Nazarene pulpits and other pulpits is evangelism. Evangelism is important, I believe. But the adjustment that we've made is that we understand that evangelism is actually a part of the discipleship process. Mm -hmm. And that the lead preacher, the lead pastor, is first a disciple maker. I remember I read a book, oh, I want to say close to 30 years ago by Bill Hull called The Disciple Making Pastor. It had a profound effect upon me. And so now I'm seeing myself as kind of the first step in this congregational model. So we preach on Sunday morning. Our people are encouraged to come and take notes and learn from them. I share a passage of scripture about Jesus being the way. Just, just want to share with you that Jesus is certainly the way to heaven. Oh, but believe me, Jesus is much more than that. Jesus has actually outlined for us a way that we can conduct our lives. The way in which we can live. And so we preach that message. And then, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Pastor Robert Wallace, the pastor of the Keswick Chapel, gives a five or seven minute video devotional where we continue to explore the passage that was shared on Sunday. And then the following Sunday, our small groups take a look at that passage again and really unpack it. That's where the questions are asked. That's where participation comes in. That's where relationships are built 
around this passage. So that when a scripture is read on Sunday morning, it's not 30 minutes and done. No, we're living underneath of that the authority of that scripture for an entire week or more. And then we rinse and repeat. And we rinse and repeat. It's a very, very simple process. But here's what I want you to know about this process. It's not perfect, but it's intentional and it's strategic. And I think that is the element, as I talk with my peers in ministry, that is the element that's missing from many of our churches. The strategy, the intentionality. Are you discipling? We hope so. Have you got a plan? Well, not really. And that's why I feel so strongly about making this statement to everyone who is listening now live on Facebook Live, those who are in this room, and also those that may hear this in the future. I ask Frank's permission first. What would happen if more of our churches became more intentional and strategic and had their own organic, intentional discipleship journey that became a part of their, their identity? That's what I feel so strongly about. And I ask Frank's permission first. He didn't ask me to do this. This is just came out of my brain. I'm simply saying, if this has resonated with you today, and you would like to know more about how to do this, I hope you will contact Frank Short. And he is available on a limited basis. Of course, he is faster. On a limited basis, he is available to come to churches and be able to share the ideas that he has shared with us here today and yesterday as well. So it can be a seminar, it can be a conversation like this, it can be through preaching, and then an ongoing resources. So I want to encourage you to consider that. And I'm going to do everything in my power to get the word out about this. I'm going to do everything I can think of to get this word out. Because it's not just CFCN that's going to benefit from this. I believe that many of our churches can benefit from what you've heard here today. Strategic, intentional, biblical discipleship. I think it can be a game changer. I think it can change the very nature of how we understand church and its mission in the world. I think it's that important. So if you'd like some more information from me about that, you can call me at 717-577-3074. Just don't try to sell me an extended warranty if you call me. That's right. And number two, if you would like to talk to Frank about this, please feel free to contact him. Share with them the contact information that you feel most comfortable with. Yeah, you can reach me either by email at pastorfrank at reallifechapel.org. Hopefully that's not muffled. Uh, or you can call me 443-786-4650. And don't worry, if I don't recognize the number, I will screen the call. Leave a message, and I may call you back. <laughs> he actually says that on his message. I may call you back, which I think is great. So, my friends, there's a lot of stake here. That's, that's why I feel so strongly about this. It is the one thing that Jesus asked his church to do. Amen. It's the one thing. It was in his last will and testament for the church. Go, and as you're going, make disciples. We can't afford to not get that right. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you for Pastor Frank Short. Um, all that you've done in his life. Uh, for Laura Lee, who stands by his side in support of him. And Lord, I just pray that in these days that something would happen here. 
May this just be a match that is thrown into the brush. I pray that something will happen here. That lives will be changed. That people will be discipled. And those who have been discipled will become disciple makers. God, thank you for allowing us to be a part of the divine conspiracy to redeem the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. Uh, we encourage you to tune in every Sunday morning at night to the uh, uh, every Sunday morning at nine o'clock for the Keswick Chapel. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I do know this. Pastor Robert um, is a great pastor in the Keswick Chapel, and he has my sincere appreciation. My, um, I mean, I just I love working with Pastor Robert, and so I want to encourage you whenever possible to join us at nine o'clock in the Keswick Chapel. I hope you have a great day.